Ladies and gentlemen, Israel and Iran have plunged into a new era of war with over 180 missiles unleashed on Israel. Last night, Iran has signaled an all-out offensive. The United States is gearing up for a joint strike as its war jets camp in the Middle East and has warned of dire repercussions for Iran. Reports from the Israeli Defense Forces reveal intense combat in southern Lebanon with multiple strikes on Hezbollah's military assets. What lies ahead? Will the conflict intensify or will these nations consider pursuing peace? Is there a way to get out of the current confrontation? To discuss with me that uh, is uh, Jonathan Conricus, former uh, IDF spokesperson and senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thank you, Jonathan, for joining me tonight. And uh, I want to ask you, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has issued a strong statement after yesterday's missile attack by Iran. The question is, when will Israel respond and how? Yes, good evening and thank you for having me. Um, this matters really, I think, on two main issues. One is, what is the Israeli strategy and what does Israel want to achieve regarding Iran? And the second, how well can Israel coordinate its activities and actions against Iran with the US and other global powers, mostly in the West, but also regional powers? Now, if we break down the first part, strategy, uh, Israel can strike different targets in order to uh, achieve different effects. One which might be the target would be the regime itself, its leadership, its institutions, its facilities, and perhaps to sow havoc and instability in Iran in order to bring about regime change. That could be one option. A second option could be to inflict damage on Iran's ability to continue to provide money and weapons to terrorist organizations. And as doing so, Israel would be able to strike various sites that are related to Iran's ability to either export or import and to generate uh, foreign funding. And the third, perhaps most critical, is the uh, option to strike the Iranian nuclear military program. Uh, there's a lot of facilities scattered all around Iran. Israel has the ability to strike them and to deliver significant damage, not necessarily to totally destroy, but to strike and damage. And it really depends on what Israel wants to achieve and how big Israel's appetite would be to deal with the Islamic Republic of Iran. I'll say that uh, I think that there's enough people in Israel now that are finally coming to be aware of the very mortal threat that the Islamic Republic, its regime, poses towards Israel, and that Israel, if it wants to continue to live in its homeland, needs to take care of the Iranian regime. Well, uh, so officially, uh, can we say that uh, Iran and Israel are now at war? Or do we wait uh, for the retaliation from Israel before we can begin to say that? No, I think that's it's safe to say this is the second time that Iran uh, has fired massive barrages of missiles and rockets towards Israel directly from Iran. The first occasion was on the 13th of April. Now is the second one. And uh, I think that uh, it's fair to declare that. Uh, Iran has also been conducting indirect warfare against Israel through its proxies in Western Asia, Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, the Houthis in Yemen, a long list of uh, horrible terrorist organizations that have been killing Israelis and firing at Israel almost relentlessly. Uh, so, yes, I think that's a fair uh, thing to say. And I don't think that we will have to wait for any declaration. Uh, the next move will be an Israeli move, whereby I hope that we will surprise the Iranians, we will strike them where they don't uh, expect to be struck and inflict damage to the regime, to its ability to continue to sow havoc in the region and to continue to support terrorist activities. At the end of the day, you know, I don't think that there will be stability or quiet and definitely not peace in Western Asia until the Iranian regime chooses a totally different strategy and stops 
providing funds and weapons to terror organizations and relinquishes its quest for nuclear weapons. Until that happens, I think that the footing will be a war footing, and I think that Israel has now finally come to the understanding that it needs to deal with the Islamic Republic of Iran. So let me ask you, what's the time frame that you're looking at uh, uh, in terms of the Israeli uh, uh, retaliation? Well, as you said so succinctly in your introduction, there's a lot going on. We're fighting, we're still fighting in Gaza. We're uh, fighting Hezbollah in Lebanon, ground operations in southern Lebanon, and we're striking Hezbollah in their centers in uh, Dahia in Beirut. And uh, we defend ourselves against missile threats. So there is no shortage of work. We need to do many things simultaneously. And as such, there is no uh, urgency to do something very, very quickly against Iran. But it's better to plan and to be well prepared. And most importantly, to have all of the diplomatic buttons buttoned up and to make sure that we have enough international support to do what we feel is necessary to do in order to defend ourselves. As such, I think we're talking about days, maybe a week. I wouldn't see the preparations go on longer than that uh, for the first Israeli retaliation against Iran. But the question is, even though Iran and Israel do not have any borders that are shared, the question many are asking is what happens to Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, among other countries, sandwiched in between? Well, they're not really sandwiched as in they didn't have a say in it and someone imposed it on them. Uh, they have knowingly allowed Iranian agents to establish themselves and they have allowed terrorist organizations to use their countries as launch pads against Israel. They have agency and they have responsibility and accountability. Uh, nobody, uh, nobody asked. Uh, Israel didn't ask for Iran to uh, build terror organizations along its border. They were terror organizations along its border. They were welcomed by Syria, by Lebanon, and by Gaza, and by Palestinians. And as such, they will deal with the consequences of harboring enemy terrorist organizations uh, within their midst. Uh, and I think that Gaza already is dealing with the consequences. Lebanon is and will deal with the consequences. And I think, very simply put, anybody that threatens Israel and harbors terrorists and fights Israel and fires at our civilians will deal with the consequences. If you don't want a war with Israel, then don't attack Israel and don't provide a stepping grounds for terrorists from within your terrain. Israel won't do anything against you then. Let me ask you, how do you respond to those who blame Israel for the escalation uh, of the situation in uh, the Middle East, in West Asia, uh, especially because you've targeted the Hezbollah leadership uh, and your air strikes have also claimed civilian casualties in Gaza and in Lebanon. How do you respond to your critics? I would urge those people to educate themselves more. I would urge them to look into the history of the Middle East. And as you said, we have been fighting wars to defend ourselves from before the state was founded. But since 48, we have fought seven different wars. And we have either won or drawn each fight. We've never lost because if we lose, we won't exist anymore. And I would say that these people are probably maybe unaware or they are ignoring the fact that Israel has offered Palestinians four uh, peace uh, deals. They have been rejected. We have been rejected four times. And Israel has made peace with both uh, two former enemies, Jordan and Egypt. Uh, and I think that it is very unfortunate to be uh, to be focusing on the victim, and Israel is the victim of regional aggression, even though we seem mighty and powerful. We are a small country of about 10 million people, less than a mid-sized city in India. And we are surrounded by lots of enemies that have very harsh extremist ideology who simply can't come to terms with the fact that the Jews are back in their ancestral homeland. And uh, it's unfortunate for them, but we are not going anywhere. We will continue to defend ourselves. We are back in our ancestral homeland where our history was written, where all of our, where the Bible, the Hebrew Bible was written, where there are thousands of years of our history here. And this is where the modern state of Israel is, whether they like it or not. And uh, Israel is 
always trying to achieve peace. We've made peace with two neighbors, and we would like to make peace with Lebanon and one day with Syria as well. But it's very difficult to make peace with entities and countries that simply want to eliminate and destroy you. Uh, but Israel will continue to aspire for that. And the last thing I would say to people who blame Israel for the current situation is that there was no fighting on October 6th. On October 7, Israel was attacked by Hamas and the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust was perpetrated by one Iranian proxy, uh, Hamas. And on the 8th of October, Hezbollah joined in and started attacking Israel and has since fired more than 9,000 rockets at Israel. Uh, over a period of a year, and 70,000 Israelis have been displaced from their homes in northern Israel. Israel is not the aggressor. Israel is defending itself, its sovereignty, and its population, like any modern self-respecting country would do. Uh, so I say to the people who continuously try to criticize Israel and turn reality upside down, please educate yourself. Please do not be confused by Iranian or Russian propaganda against Israel. And please educate yourself about the history of the conflict. Then I'm sure that you will see things differently. Let me ask you, uh, this uh, escalation will also mean uh, countries uh, in the world taking positions either with uh, Israel or against it with Iran. Where do you see Saudi Arabia, with whom uh, Israel has built up uh, some bridges? Uh, how do you see Qatar? Uh, how do you see these countries? Where do you see China, United States, uh, as well as Russia in this entire uh, war that is unfolding? Yeah, let's. I think that the aim will be to uh, limit the spread of hostilities and not turn this into regional and definitely not global. But in terms of axes, uh, Iran is aligned with China and Russia, the non-democratic countries of the world, uh, oppressive regimes that are uh, doing horrible things domestically and internationally uh, all, all around the globe. Israel is aligned with democracies, with the United States of America, and in uh, uh, many ways with uh, the West and shares w uh, values of democracy, rule of law, and uh, respect and sanctity of uh, human life. Uh, the Saudis and other Gulf countries, I think, will be very supportive of Israel. Maybe they won't have the moral courage to do it openly and to stand with Israel and fight with Israel. But I think that behind the scenes, the US-led axis of Israel, Saudi Arabia, Gulf countries, and basically Abraham Accord countries will uh, stand on Israel's side. Well, uh, with peace uh, really not having too much of a chance, as uh, the UN Secretary General is banned from entering Israel at all, uh, and considering that this is a signal that Israel does not expect uh, the UN to bring about peace, yes, countries will have to take a position. What will be the position taken by countries across the world is a subject matter of interest for you, Jonathan, as well as uh, we back home in India who are watching this space. But in the meanwhile, we uh, wish all the very best uh, to people in Israel. And we do hope uh, human rights uh, are seen above everything else and uh, lives of civilians are protected. Uh, that's the prayer that comes uh, from India to you, Jonathan, and the people in uh, that part of the world. Thank you very much for joining me on the News Hour tonight and thank you viewers for being with me on the show, The News Hour at Night.